Touring, one of the most enjoyable parts of a musician's life, or is it? This week we speak to more top musicians who have done a lot of it and got the t-shirt. This is Anyone Can Play Guitar, the podcast for musicians and music lovers that takes you behind the scenes of the music industry. This week is brought to you in partnership with MGR Music. Ever wanted to learn an instrument, hone your skills, or pick up something completely new? You can get so far by yourself, however, professional guidance can make all the difference. With a network of tutors right across the UK, and rates starting from as little as £15 per hour, visit mgrmusic.com now to get started. Hello and welcome back to episode 43 of the show with me, James, and him, Ben. Last week we covered songwriting where we heard lots from great artists including Bare Naked Ladies co-founder Stephen Page. Oh, I'm, I'm really ruthless with it. Although sometimes if, a, if some idea sticks around for a long period of time, I feel like that there was probably some value in it. But today is all about touring. In an age where selling physical copies of music in a vinyl or CD format is no longer the thing it once was, a tour can be essential for bringing in the much needed cash. This is a topic that some artists have mixed feelings towards though, so definitely worth a closer examination. In season one, we spoke to John Higgs of Everything Everything about it. If it feels like it's worth doing, it is. There are there have been times where you go abroad and no one cares, and you're like, well, why are we here? This mm-hmm. costs loads of money. We miss our families. But for all the challenges and hardships, overall... It's great. Sometimes I think I could probably take more advantage of being in those places. And I don't really, don't really get out and have a look at where I am. So making the most of it while you are wherever you happen to be is something to consider. Along with how often you do it. I don't think we tour hard as a band. Right. I don't think we tour a lot as a band. Do you think that helps? For getting people through the door if they have yes, less chance to no, see Yes, that's you. another... Um, thing we talked about just today, Jeremy was saying we can't do five festival seasons on the bounce guys people will be bored of us. These are some of the many, many things to consider when touring Coming up in today's episode you'll hear from a few of our friends of season two, including Justin Lockley of Editors, We Are Scientists Sam Duckworth aka Get Kate, Wear Kate, Fly, but some also some new guests including Fickle Friends The Sheepdogs, John Newman and Jimmy Adkins of Jimmy Eat World Here you can expect a bit of this. You'd honestly I'll probably be just be better off driving through the night and <laughs> standing up awake outside of the next day's venue. <laughs> and a bit of this. I could, I could, I was sick and I could barely stand up yeah. in Nottingham. Yeah. And it was like, as doors were opening. Remember, a great way to support the show is to go on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give us a rating and a review. It really does make a massive difference for the show. Now, on with the episode. <laughs> Let's start this episode with the fine gents from We Are Scientists. Keith and Chris met at college in California back in 1997 and after releasing their debut album in the summer of 2002, it was the summer of 2005 when their singles for their second album were released. And that's when they started to break through into the mainstream a bit more. During those early years, they toured a lot in the USA and Europe, picking up with plenty of learnings on the way. So what would you say are the main do's and do nots when touring? Hmm. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's so many do's or do nots that are economically motivated, Mm -hmm. I would say, or predicated. Uh, so it's tough to make blanket statements that would apply to tours of any size. But I guess we're talking about starting out and let's assume that you're trying to save money and that you're on a pretty shoestring budget. Mm -hmm. Dues. Airbnb is pretty, has been a real nice, uh, revelation for us recently in terms of getting multiple people into one property that would otherwise yeah because one of my don'ts and i recognize that you know economically sometimes this is mandatory and also that some bands seem to like it but i think they're lying mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> d- don't don't take up uh 
you know, people's offer is for you to sleep at their place because oh, yeah. you will you will be made to pay for it. Nothing. Con- There's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> That's true. Uh, like any time back in the day, we ever slept on someone's couch. Uh, we were kept up all night by their insistence on like wanting to hang out because it was like their one night mm-hmm. of partying with a with a gang. Yeah. So they always want to like drink. Mm-hmm. They always want to chat and you know talk about ways of economically touring. <laughs> uh, and you, you'd honestly probably be just be better off driving through the night and, mm-hmm. and standing up awake outside of the next day's venue. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's, that's a good point, though. Now, you know, some people argue that, you know, that's a great way of, uh, you know, actually getting to know mm-hmm. different places. Mm. Uh, but I disagree. I strongly disagree. <laughs> yeah, like studying abroad and staying with a family. Exactly. Exactly. Of <laughs> An immersion in your own apartment. Yeah. 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 But we, yeah, we we do disagree with that. So, over the years, in the main, the dudes, like, has anything changed? So, success has that changed? Anything that you do, like, do you always thank certain people? Do you always arrive on time? For example, you're always not a dick. For example. Hmm. Yeah, we. It, it certainly helps to not be a dick. You do find uh, after a few years of touring that, like you, you realize that people who work at venues do remember mm-hmm. you from last time. And for us, we're often uh, happy that they seem to be pleased we're back, and that promoters generally, yeah, I think enjoy having us back. Uh, but we have had occasions that I'm sure left a bad taste in promoters mouths okay and i don't think it was i don't think keith or i has ever specifically done anything ourselves but uh that that's another important lesson is to realize that you're responsible for everyone who's on the road with you and mm-hmm. that yeah. any of them can make a bad impression that will adhere to your name mm-hmm. and and may affect your ability to come back to that town or mm-hmm. at least that venue work with that promoter yeah work with that yeah. promoter again so I guess on the don'ts, and then like, who would you see if you if there's one person not to piss off? Who would it be? Oh, probably. I mean, you should probably shouldn't piss Pete off your manager, Pete I guess. Or the Saudi prince. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. MBS. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Don't fuck with MBS. Because uh, hmm. we heard that like, you're your accountant, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. There's one if you had to choose one person not to fuck with, be your accountant, because even your lawyer could get in trouble for malpractice if they deliberately sabotaged you. (laughs) (laughs) They just like wrote you a bad contract or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, there, there is always, uh, it, it seems as if there are always, uh, are specific promoters who kind of have a stranglehold regionally on places. Uh, and so you you sort of want to be in the good graces of the big promoter mm-hmm. in each town who kind of like generally kind of controls the playable venues mm-hmm. around. Yeah. I don't think we've ever crossed any of any of those types, but uh, like for example, I can imagine that crossing like Dave McGeekin. Yeah, uh, he seems he seems like a pretty good guy. Seems like he wouldn't be someone that would hold a grudge, but if he if he did just like hate you for reasons that you gave him, you'd have a really hard time playing good Scottish shows, I think. You would. It's true. Uh, we once had a an Instagram takeover that we were doing for um, a giant California promoter called Golden Voice, which is also involved in other yeah. uh, North American locations these days but i think mm-hmm. when we started out 15 years ago or so they were basically southern california but they started coachella for example okay and we, so we did an instagram takeover we were driving from portland to san francisco and we decided to go off the beaten track so we could find some swimming holes and so we had no phone service for like the whole day of our supposed takeover <laughs> and we have not been invited back to Coachella since. <laughs> <That's true>. <laughs> <laughs> have to assume. The uh, all, and all, you know, the, perhaps not coincidentally. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you remember the last time we did play Coachella, we got accused of trashing our dressing room, which we did oh. not do. I do have a vague memory of that. What was the deal? Did I we, don't know. Did... We we you know we probably left at like 
midnight or something like that and oh, somebody uh, else and out. yeah there are definitely still many many bands around uh, and and apparently our dressing room ended up a real wreck uh, that's wild we, mm. we we definitely got like chastised for it no they did years later invite us to take over their instagram they're account very, it can't have been them their most private <laughs> and yeah. important thing the instagram account <laughs> yeah. that bears their name so yeah we're back well, at least we had their trust again we lost it we lost it when we failed to post once bitten twice nine shy nine. they say yeah. well, it's twice bitten <laughs> fuck we are scientists <laughs> Next up are Fickle Friends, hailing from Brighton on the southern shores of the UK. Formed in 2013, they spent a couple of years touring across Europe before signing to Polydor Records and releasing their debut album in 2018. Touring is typically a very different experience to your everyday life. With Natty and Sam, we spoke about looking after your body. So, you're now on tour, what, what date are we on now on your, on your tour? Six. Out of eight. Out of eight, okay. Actually, yeah, six out of eight. Yeah. Okay. And, and Quite I know, a short one. Hmm. I know Nottingham was a bit of a bumpy moment because I think it was cancelled, didn't it? We yeah, did we have, have to, cancel to that unfortunately. One. Unfortunately, yeah, but it's been rich. We, we rescheduled, we rescheduled straight away, yeah. So, <coughs> that how, very night. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you survive on tour? And, like, how far, reading between the lines on your tweets and your Instagram, that whatever was lingering was lingering for a couple of days, how far do you push it? make sure you do the gigs every night and do your push it well I'm still ill yeah Yeah. (laughs) so um, you just have to call it I mean it takes a lot for us to cancel a show Uh I think I mean it's definitely different for you though because it's your voice that gets affected if I'm feeling really ill I can still play the drums Mm -hmm. you know I don't have to sing and front (coughs) and I'm running around a lot as well and yeah um, and I can I'll play with a cough or a cold or yeah. I've, I've got well actually I have a really bad virus so don't want to infect you but, <laughs> um, I could I could I was sick and I could barely stand up yeah. in Nottingham yeah. and it was like as doors were opening and it yeah. just happened and I was like I don't I can't I can't do the show I actually can't do it mm-hmm. it's Which like we all me we all me out on a flight case we wheeled you out to the van and I took you back to the travel lodge yeah. travel lodge yeah. yeah. classic. But I mean, it's it's quite difficult. Yeah. Like everyone gets ill on tour, especially because yeah. we've spent three weeks in the US Prior doing shows this, solidly yeah. before this. Um, you just get ill, you get run down, you don't get a lot of sleep. Yeah. So, what sort of things would you suggest to new bands? You think you know what? I'm just going to we're just going to go on tour. What's the best way to survive a tour? Um, Vitamins. Will you get all your supplements? Yeah, <laughs> supplements are good to uh-huh. be fair because you know you sometimes you just don't get good quality food. And that's yeah. what kind of makes your body work. Yeah. So you kind of need to pay attention to that. It's kind of simple because, uh, well, I mean, on our first tour, all you want to do is you just want to get drunk every night mm-hmm. and just, you know, that, that's all you want to do. But don't drink too much. Get yeah. enough sleep. Yeah. Don't eat McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and a fucking dinner. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. go and eat somewhere healthy or do something for your body. Have your supplements, eat fruit, whatever. Drink loads of water. Yeah. Um, and do your warm ups, I guess, is yeah. all we can suggest. Perfect. <laughs> So we've talked a bit about what to do when on tour, but when do you start touring and get out of the towns and cities where you're from? Is it once you've developed a tight life show in your local area? Not for your code name is Milo. That was one of the many bands Justin Lockley was involved in before joining the editors. When I caught up with him in Northam University last year, this is one of the things we spoke about. I used to work in the, I used to work in the Ents department here, mm-hmm. um, like so 18 years ago. And I've not been back, this is the first time I've been back in the building since I left. Yeah, and a lot has happened in eighteen years. Of course, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's good. It's good to be back. Cool, put, some good, put some really great shows on in the room that I'm playing tonight. So yeah, yeah, it's really good. So was that all pre your code name's Milo? It was as that was happening. That right. that band effectively started down that corridor there. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on that stage at Reds, probably. Um, I don't know if we played that. No, we didn't. We never played it. We didn't play much in Newcastle. For a Newcastle yeah. band, we never played much in Newcastle at all. We um, made it a thing. To not play to our mates, uh, yeah, straight off the bat because playing to your mates is is he's never really a um, good indicator of how good a band you are because they're going to tell you you're all right anyway, yeah. or they're going to tell you shit just, just because <laughs> they're your mates. Of course. So, so yeah, we went we went to I think London it was um, we just got out out of town really really early doors on that band. And you think that helped? I think it helped a lot because. We didn't see ourselves as a local band. I mean, I, 
you know, singers from, they were all from Sunderland, mm-hmm. Washington Way. I was from Yorkshire mm-hmm. and it didn't feel like a part of anything that was out in town at that time. At the time, we had like Kubicek and bands like that, and they're all yeah. lovely guys and stuff. And like early incarnations of field music, mm-hmm. Maximo were just starting. Heads were probably around about that time as well. Yeah, Future Heads were, they were a step ahead of everyone because mm-hmm. they'd already got records out and stuff. But we kind of, we didn't fit in sound wise with any of them, so we kind of just went off and did what, what we wanted to do. And uh, took a leap of faith. I think that's, well, yeah, and I think that's all you can do when you do music. Is the whole point about it is. You make music for lots and many people as you can get to hear here. Yeah. You know, and if you keep it in a close scene, then you're just playing the same people, just in a different bar every other week. This week is brought to you in partnership with MGR Music. Ever wanted to learn an instrument, hone your skills, or pick up something completely new? You can get so far by yourself, however, professional guidance can make all the difference. With a network of tutors right across the UK and rates starting from as little as £15 per hour, visit mgrmusic.com now to get started. Whether they're small local charities or big global operations, we're always happy to promote good causes on the show. This week, it's the latter, as Justin Lockley describes how editors are closely aligned to Oxfam. Um, editors as a band are very, very closely aligned with Oxfam. Uh-huh. Um, this year alone, I think Tom, Ed, and L went to visit a uh, refugee camp in Greece, and then one later in Serbia while we were there touring, uh, doing a show. Um, and I think Oxfam, although it's one of those big charities, and you know they get a lot, I just think they're working. They they they're consistently working to change things, and we're closely aligned to them. We, we raise quite quite a lot of money for them and awareness for them, and we're. You know, it's essentially it's, it's who we back. It's our charity. Brilliant. Great charity. You can find out more at Oxfam.org about how they're working to tackle poverty around the world. Also, coming up in the UK in October is the Oxjam uh, Festival, which is a series of gigs um, across the UK. Go to Oxfam.org.uk forward slash Oxjam, that's O X J A M, um, to find out more. Not a UK-based thing either. There's um, Oxjam festivals throughout the globe, so have a look for for one in your own area. Now, on with the episode. Okay, now we'll go to Sam Duckworth, a.k.a. Get Cape, Wear Cape, Fly. We heard from him in the songwriting episode, and we're still in the midst of a sound check, just so you know. (laughs) To be fair, Ben... You haven't done too badly on this season. Thank uh, you. There's, there's not been too many Mr. B. Edinburgh wind uh, background incidents. Wind gate, yes. Yes. <laughs> it's got a gate. I don't know. I can't believe I just give it a gate. Well, yeah, it, it warranted a gate. It did. If only there had been a gate. <laughs> <laughs> might have uh, stopped some of that wind. It could have. It could have. A common theme for artists is that touring can range from the best time of your life to a necessary evil. But what did Sam say? So the um, the touring side of it, do you still get on with touring? Do you still like it? I'm having the time of my life on this tour. Yeah. I really hate it touring, to be honest. Right. Like, really great to just like it. And I realise it's just... Um, yeah, I think the thing with touring is it's hard. Because all the things that really grind you down about touring are all things that... Lots of people would be like, oh, you know, but you're also doing this and that's great. Mm-hmm. And that's fine, isn't it? Like to yeah. have post, you know, positive, negative balance, and have like a kind of net gain of it being a really good thing to be doing. Yeah. But sometimes, like not sleeping for ages, or you know, having random diets, or you know, yeah. being at the mercy of traffic. When you're trying to, you know, have a rest of another life outside of that, mm-hmm. you know, touring full time when all you got to do is tour. So when you're younger, is amazing. Yeah. Touring when you start to get older and have more responsibilities is more difficult. It takes a different mindset. Don't make it work. Work. Yeah. Worthwhile. Yeah. And and also like it's got to be really fun and really enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Like, people have got to come to the show and be like, oh, that that was amazing. Let's come again. Yeah. Like, I think a tired tour is a tour that needs to be stopped. 
Right, got you. You know what I mean? It's like you don't want to watch a band tired because I think sometimes some cities get lumbered with them because it's always on the loop. Mm-hmm. Well. <laughs> I know what you mean, yeah. So it's... Um, Where it lands, yeah. It's making sure that there's that energy for this tour. I mean, this tour is just hilarious. Everyone gets on really well, knows yeah, each other cool. really well. Also knows how to, like, not play. Right. I think really good musicians can do all the tech- technical stuff and all the tricky stuff, but also know when the best time is to not play at all. Yeah. And I think that's a respect thing. That's a understanding the groove and I think it's just kind of everyone's plugged into that instantly in this in this group of people so it's just it's easy that's good well I, I, it's good to hear as well that you, after 12 years probably that's when that's when your first album came so it's probably longer than that that it's still want to do it that, that can't be a bad thing I think I probably want to do it now more than at any point except right. when I first started okay. that's, that's cool. in terms of playing live I wonder anyway. what it is is it just something it's get. It's getting on and enjoying, getting yeah. on with everyone, enjoying the uh-huh. show, and also feeling the confidence of everybody being on top of the game. Editors are now at the point that they can tour comfortably, as Justin puts it. However, touring in the traditional way still does not work for him. So what does Justin do? Do you find touring different now that you're in mm. that part of your career where you're not, uh, I guess, We're not in deal? the back of a van? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we tour really comfortably. And so I think it's because we're at a level we can't all really come to be we're luckily enough to be a band that still grows in lots of different parts of the world you know mm-hmm. it's like playing in England playing in the UK is you know we're what academy level yeah. mostly you know we usually end on like Brixton Academy or there'll be an Apollo in Manchester or an Apollo in London but it's usually like top end of academy world yeah um, which, which I- allows for a certain level of comfort in the UK in Europe you know, parts of your we're an arena band, mm-hmm. so it works for us to be able to talk comfortably. I, on the other hand, don't talk comfortably because I don't. I get, I find it really hard to talk. I can't sleep on a bus, so I travel by myself. Really, okay. I travel a lot of it by myself. I'm, I, because I'm a writer and a director. I spend a lot of time traveling to shows on my own, working on the other things that I do in my head, mm-hmm. which is. A great time. I get lots of time to drive in some great parts of the planet, see some amazing sights on my own, peace and quiet to think. And, and there's a thing about being on tour when you're in a bus and you're constantly going from country to country, town to town, is that you kind of, there's like a submarine kind of mentality to it. Even though it could be the most luxurious bus, there's still a submarine mentality to yeah. it that you can't escape. You, you you know, you're not in charge of your own destiny. You are trapped on a bus and you're in a bunk or bedroom. While although it's really nice, if that's not good for you, healthy in mm-hmm. health, it's not for me. It's really bad for me. Mm-hmm. That you have to find another way to do it. So I I travel by myself. Uh, drive drive if I can. You know, I like really big long drives so I can think, listen to music, mm-hmm. uh, or fly. Yeah. So that's what I do for every show. And I just meet the guys here. Yeah. And then after the show, I go back to my hotel, get a good night's sleep, which I wouldn't do on a bus, and then drive to the next show. Which is, you know, in a place like England, it's really easy. Yeah, of course. Because you, you're never more than really a few hours away from your next show. Mm-hmm. Um, in Europe, it gets a little bit harder, you know, but then the the upside of it is you're driving through the Alps on your own. Of course, yeah. You, and nobody's telling you where to go, what to do, thingy. So, you know... When we go into Europe, the end thing I can I can spend a day driving through the Alps on my own, peace and quiet, mm-hmm. and I can sit at the top of the Alps in deafening silence, looking at some of the best sights you're likely to ever see on mm-hmm. my own, and it's inspiring. It's more inspiring yeah. than being sat in a bus, uh, uh, keeping out, trying to keep out of other people's way when yeah. everyone's been on, on top of each other for too long. So I like that. That's my but that's my personal choice and preference. Mm-hmm. The rest of them. They, 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 they sleep comfortably and they, they love that element of what they do touring wise but for me it's, it's just not it's just not for me so yeah you know so, yeah that's, that's, that's a nice way of looking at touring actually I never well yeah I mean, you've got to think about it. if you if you're on a bus on a regular tour you're on a bus you go to a building like this that we're in now and see a black room yeah and then you get on a bus and it's night time and you drive overnight and then you wake up and you come into another building like this, essentially the same building in a different town, and you just see a series of black rooms. Mm-hmm. 
at night times. You don't really see anything. Your day's off. Sometimes you're just too tired to do anything anyway. Cause you're playing two hours a night. You're just knackered. Yeah. You've got to catch up with your sleep. Whereas I see everything. Because mm-hmm. I travel in the daytime. I travel, spend most of my day traveling. So I get to see the countries that we go to. And then days off, <clears throat> I'm either a day ahead of the band or say like last summer in festival season then we had a show in like Switzerland and then the next show was like four days later in South Italy I spent four days travelling through the Alps and down Italy on my own you don't see that in a bus no <laughs> at night you know no. I mean yeah they'll get there in 14 hours overnight and they'll be asleep for most of it but I, I want to stop off on the day I want, I want to stop off two hours down the road every day and see these parts of the world that we're just flying through flying through but let's not forget that touring can be, and should be, a whole lot of fun. It was also fun for We Are Scientists, who go full circle on some of their earlier advice to make sure everyone makes the most of it. What would you say is the best way to survive a tour, and the best way to enjoy a tour? Because obviously you're going to different city, find food, yeah. later, later nights and all that, and travelling, and sickness, and it's freaking freezing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, sort of... Contrary to my advice about not staying at people's Mm -hmm. places, I was initially going to say, you know, try not to party too much. But that that definitely made our first several years of touring a lot of fun, like going out to bars and clubs after our shows and stuff. Yeah, that's true. Uh, So I, I, I wouldn't, you know. We no longer really do that very much, <laughs> uh, but it definitely definitely was like part of what was fun about touring for back sure. then for twenty seven year olds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you're on the tour, do you, do you get time to write at all? Mm-hmm. No. Well, no. We can barely barely reply to emails when we're touring. It's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so in this case, I just don't want to write as well. I mean, I wouldn't mind if I were feverishly writing, mm-hmm. uh, but that, just the conditions for writing are never really present. Like, you're never alone. Mm. Uh, you know, I get annoyed when, you know, our drummer is, like, trying to tune his drums. Okay. So I'm like, ah, just quiet down, please. <laughs> so I can't imagine if I were up there, like, making a racket trying to write songs. Definitely always feel bad when we're playing songs, like, longer than our sound check allotment and... You know, some guy's sweeping the floor and has to listen to We Are Scientists, <laughs> the last music. So, like, we it's did. just, there's just never, like, a sense of, like, freedom of doing Like, being playful about playing okay. music on tour, I yeah. think. Okay. It was a quick semi-nostalgic look back at how touring has changed with We Are Scientists. A takeaway we got from this is that even if the idea of touring doesn't appeal to you now, don't necessarily write it off for the future as things will undoubtedly change. It's definitely, uh, I mean, you know, broadly speaking, modernizations uh, stemming yeah. from primarily mobile fo- you know, phone technology have made a huge difference. Yeah. They've made a lot of things easier that were once fairly complicated. It's almost not really worth looking back since we won't be returning to those days <laughs> yeah. unless things go very poorly politically <laughs> in the next couple of years. But uh, yeah, when we started, we still had to like purchase uh, paper maps of right. regions of the United States, for example, that we were going to go tour because you know that was how you well that was how you got a map in the old yeah. days. That's how you found your way. Uh, um, so, my my first associations with UK touring were the like amalgamation of urine and then urine covering sprays in uh, phone booths. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because I always had to, you know, buy a, buy a phone card mm-hmm. yeah. and then make long distance calls. Call girlfriend at home. Yeah. yeah. I can even remember, you know, more recent developments like, uh, you know, so long after cell phones were commonplace in your hometown it was still very difficult to travel to another country Mm -hmm. and use your smartphone like you would have to either establish an account in the uk under your british manager's name or something like we had a real hard time using cell phones it was only in the last couple years we've been able to actually use our actual our phones that we own at home and so for a long time even though you had google maps in new york city 
it wouldn't you wouldn't be able to use it when you were in Paris or Barcelona or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. And then like two years ago, three years ago, Google allowed you to save maps, and that was like a sea change. <laughs> a revolution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could view them offline. Yeah. And that was amazing. And then not soon after that, we were able to just actually do get what you want. Get yeah. a cell signal in other countries. So, new guest alert, James. Woo-hoo. Someone we'll be hearing from a lot in the com- forthcoming episodes is Jimmy Adkins of Jimmy Eat World. Ooh, tell me more about Jimmy Eat World then, Ben. Jimmy Eat World were my university s- semester one band. They released their breakthrough massive album, Bleed American. And it was just my album of that time. I love the title track. And that was probably their biggest hit alongside The Middle, which even people who will play FIFA remember because it was on one of the FIFAs or Pro Evo or one of those. Anyway, I digress. They were formed in 1993 in Arizona mm. and have gone on to release nine studio albums. And if you're on their Instagram recently, they're currently recording number 10. That's not bad going, Ben. It's not bad going at all, especially the way albums are, are done these days. Yeah. But when it comes to touring, for Jimmy, there's an element of touring never actually ends. I don't know if I'm describing this right. In the middle of a tour, in the middle of a tour. So you're on your own tour in the middle of Frank's support tour. You never really clock out of touring. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of just like, yeah, I guess you could say we're in the middle of a tour, in the middle of a tour, in the middle of a tour. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Means, I don't know. Sometimes, like you know, we we play guitar and write songs, and sometimes there's people in front of us. Okay, that's, 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 that's how I'm looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> so for I've just dropped in Frank there. That's Frank Turner, who um, we had on the podcast last season, who put me in touch with yourself as a fan of your work. Yeah, yeah. So how is the two are going? Like both of them? Is it? And how's the it's weather? Good. How's the weather treating you? Yeah. Um, it's you know it's. It's cold and rainy, <laughs> which is, it's, it's sort of refreshing though. We don't get a whole lot of that in the desert yeah. where, where, where we're from. So it's, even that is kind of nice. Okay. It's going really well. You know, we're, we're, I mean, Frank does big shows mm-hmm. and it's really fun to be tagging along for that. That's cool. So do you tour the UK often? Like when you do, is it more festival circuits? No, we, it's sort of half, right? Half, half, you know, like mm-hmm. Uh, this is maybe our second or third time here in Newcastle. You last played it not that long ago, because I remember yeah. it popping up and um, down. So, I mean, we, we, we try to get everywhere that we can. Yeah. There's still some places we haven't really done a whole lot. John Newman feels the same about it, never ending. New guest alert for the season, Ben. Mm-hmm. Tell me, tell me a little snippet about uh, John Newman. Well, John Newman burst onto the scene in uh, 2012-2013 with such collaborations with people like Rudimental, his massive hit Love Me Again, which was from the album Tribute, which sold about 1.3 million. It's not a small amount, Ben. And he's also uh, worked with a very up-and-coming uh, producer called Calvin Harris. He's also good friends with this Ed Sheeran bloke. I think he'll do all right. We we'll talked about him in the full episode, which we'll hear later in the season. But for now... For now, John felt that Turin can get boring if it becomes very samey. So, uh what did he do to freshen things up? Yeah, two days in and I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long, isn't it? It's a long. It is. It's a bit daunting, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Like, just we're driving a camper van. It was my stupid dream at night. I thought we should drive a camper van because I'm sick of posh hotel rooms and posh cars into posh nightclubs and just. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's like we're not actually fucking touring here. We're not traveling. Yeah, we're yeah. just sitting in nice environments and saying the same old jokes. <laughs> and that got well boring. So I was like, I think we should just get in a camper van. And yeah. <laughs> and it actually, it's actually really worked. I mean, it's smashing us up because we're doing all the driving and everything. But I wanted to go back to the start. I didn't want... I, Got a bit bored of it. Got a bit yeah. bored of putting the suit on, yeah. doing the dancing, and and just getting on a scissor lift. I got a bit bored. Right. I was like, that's not for that. So I was like, let's go back to the start and start again. Even if we we don't need to go back to the start, let's mm-hmm. go back to the start. And because I think it's the most important thing. And I, I think I'll probably do this a few times throughout my career. I think it's really important to do. Press the reset button. Yeah. Yeah. For me. And yeah. 
for me, being there. Yeah, yeah, I, I can imagine because. No, I'm here in this piss stinking room eating a shit prawn sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, another band we'll hear more from in future episodes of this series is the Sheepdogs. Now, the Sheepdogs are a band I discovered on a family holiday to Canada, and unbeknown to me, my uh, cousin actually knew someone who was linked to them regarding their early tour videos. Mm -hmm. But they are also most notably uh, renowned for being the first unsigned band to feature on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Quite fit. Yeah, which was a big deal. Mm. Entering that competition really led to the next stage in their career and a lot of interest coming from people. They had a big pool of unsigned bands and then the yeah. competition to see who, would, who was going to be the cover band and we won it. So it, that was the whole thing, was that it was unsigned bands. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was in 2011. It was a big, yeah. a big shot we had for our career. And that was around the time of, I don't know, wasn't it? About yeah. similar type of time. And that was the song that, I'm assuming you played on Jimmy Fallon and stuff like it that. It was, yeah. yeah. So what was it like? I'm, I'm not entirely sure of the time scales, but on a Friday, you were doing what you were doing. And on yeah. Monday, this comes out. How much does it change? Does it change quickly? Does it well, explode? As soon as the competition was announced and they had announced that there were 16 contestants kind of in a tournament all yeah. of a sudden our, we were very much in demand uh, especially on a press thing yeah. we were going to New York to do um, uh, various uh, parts you know various photo shoots and performances uh, we started to get added to festival bills in Canada uh, so and, and you know we were sort of struggling to like pay bills prior to that and we were still working jobs in Saskatoon, so it was a very big change. It wasn't like all of a sudden we had like big fat bank accounts and were like, you know, doing any tour dates we wanted, but it was like certainly like a ton of publicity and an opportunity. So yeah. yes, it was very good. The point of this is that if you're not currently touring and want to, sometimes you need to think outside the box to drum up some interest before festivals and other venues are going to come knocking. That's a great segue, James, talking about festivals, because next episode is all about a dedicated episode to festivals. Yes. You do love a segue. I love a segue. I love a festival. Yeah, yes. As our delve into touring now comes to an end, set yourself up for success. Make sure it works for you, whatever your circumstances may be. Look after your body, and most importantly, enjoy it. Yeah, no point being out on tour, playing music every night, and not enjoying it. And breaking your body <laughs> yeah so coming up next week as we've said is festivals everyone loves a festival then who, who doesn't like a festival oh i love a festival even the founding member of the killers dave cooning i think i like that you don't get a sound check yeah <laughs> you just like you just go up there and you just do it yeah so there's a little bit of an atmosphere of uh, Looseness. Additional new snippets from the interviews you've heard today will pop up in other episodes later in the season. And at the end of season two, we'll release each conversation with all of our guests in full as standalone episodes. As a reminder, if you like the show, please, please take a few seconds just to give us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts from. It makes a huge difference in helping us grow our audience and promoting the show. And as Ben disappeared before giving you the answer to his quiz question from last week, the country that has no red, white or blue in their flag? Jamaica. All of the show notes for today's episode can be found at acpgmusic.com along with our back catalogue of episodes. If you like what you hear, or perhaps have some improvements or specific guests you'd like us to consider, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at info at acpgmusic.com or hit us up on social media. Keep supporting upcoming artists, and we'll catch you next time.